Hello class and welcome to chapter 2. In this lecture we're going to talk about corporate governance and the nature of board members. So let's get started. As we talked about in other uh, lectures here for chapter 2, the board of directors is a group of individuals who's responsible for overseeing top management, making sure that top management is doing what's in the best interest of the shareholders. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about the composition of the board member team. I mentioned earlier that the average board for an organization here in America is somewhere between uh, 6 to 12 individuals. They can be larger, they can be smaller, it just depends. But the vast majority of organizations fit in that structure. And the board of directors is that one group of individuals who's responsible for hiring, firing, and evaluating the CEO. So you can imagine that this is a very important role, a very important group when it comes to organizations. Now, if the board of directors consisted of everyone who reported to the CEO, then that gives the CEO unprecedented power, right? Because if the people on the board are the CFO, the CMO, the CIO, and other C-level executives, how are they going to actually be able to evaluate monitor and control the actions of the CEO when he or she could just simply decide to fire them. So what you find is that the board of directors consists typically of people who are both employees of the organization, what we call inside directors, and people who are not employees of the organization, what we call outside directors. It's important that outside directors are on the board because they don't have to, uh, they're not subject to the same fears or reprisals should they disagree with what the CEO is doing. Most often, as we said before, these are successful individuals in their own right. Uh, they may be high-ranking executives or CEOs of other corporations or um, retired CEOs, but either way it goes, outside directors, they don't work for the firm, the firm, and they don't report directly to the CEO. This gives them the ability to act objectively and to share their opinions without the worry of intimidation from the CEO. On this slide, we're going to talk a little bit about the different types of directors. And specifically, uh, some of these are inside directors and other family member directors. They may be outside. It just depends on how, uh, whether they're working for the company or not. But affiliated directors are individuals that don't directly work for the company. However, they do work that involves the company. So this could be, for example, the CEO of an insurance company. I have a board. And Allstate Insurance is my uh, insurance provider. We're a major client for them. And the CEO of Allstate is also on my board of directors. So you can see they're an outside board member, clearly. They don't report to the CEO uh, or to me if I'm the CEO of the corporation. But they do have this relationship with the company. So that can, from a political standpoint, give some strong political power and credence to the CEO when it comes to this particular director because that director is not interested in losing this very uh, profitable and very lucrative business account. So you want to be mindful of that. Now, I do want to say that board members are supposed to bring value to the company. As such, you want board members that are experts in their industry, experts in related industry, that they're able to use their connections, their resources to help further the goals of your, your company. Okay? Now, if you are an affiliate director, the idea is that you're bringing these resources and everything to the organization to help them achieve their strategic goals. So having the CEO of my a very large insurance company on my board of directors can add tremendous value. Another type of executors, uh, board members are executive directors. These are directors who used to work for the company. They may have retired or they left for one reason or another, but uh, they have a tremendous amount of knowledge and experience. And this is really great because they actually understand how the company works. This is why it's important to have some inside board members, is because they understand what the company is actually facing. And if there ever is a chance or, or a time when the board member is not exactly in sync with the top management, you need people there who understand exactly the challenges that the company is facing and that what they will face as they try to implement various strategies. This knowledge is invaluable when it comes to making the right decisions. So having inside directors or retired executive directors on your board is a 
very good idea. The last one we're going to talk about here are family directors. These are people who are directors because they're direct descendants of the founder. Um, they may own significant, most likely will, own significant amounts of stock in the organization, and their relationship, their familial status is what granted them their right to be on the board. The same concept applies. If I have a person on the board who offers no value, the only thing is that they were related to, they're the son of the founder, that doesn't go a long way to help an organization be successful. So even though they're family directors, you really want them to still have business knowledge, business savvy, experience in the industry, some special knowledge set, connections, something that will help the organization be successful and move, move toward their goals. Now, as we stated before, the board of directors is responsible for overseeing the CEO and top management. The question that you want to think about here is what mechanisms, other than hiring or firing them, does the board have uh, in their control to make sure the CEO and top management are doing things that are in the best interest of the shareholders? Well, there's two prevailing theories on this. One is called agency theory and the other is called stewardship theory. And they couldn't be more opposite. Agency theory contends that people are going to operate in the manner that's best for themselves no matter what. They're going to do or engage in behaviors and actions that benefit themselves. And we ought to know this, accept it. We don't run from it. We don't try to fight it. We don't try to change it. We simply accept this as a given. But what we do is we adjust our strategy and how we, how we interact with them to make sure that our interests and their self-motivated interests are in alignment. So what you'll see is that boards will oftentimes structure some or all of the compensation with that theory in mind. Now, the shareholders, they want to maximize their investments. They want to maximize the stock price, get major dividends, and continue to have their investment in the corporation be profitable. So what organizations do who subscribe to agency theory is that they make sure the CEO is compensated when those types of activities take place. So the higher stock price goes up, the more the CEO gets rewarded with compensation. This could take the form of straight cash, bonuses, uh, increases in salary, it could take the, take the form of extra benefits, or very often, stock options. Because if a, corp if a CEO is given stock options, well, the stronger the stock price, or the higher the stock price goes up, the more valuable those stock options. So he or she has motivated self-interest to, to, to drive the stock prices higher, which is, if you recall, the overall goal of the shareholders or the owners of the company. So people who subscribe to agency theory, they work diligently to make sure that the CEO is compensated and motivated in the same manner or, or toward the same activities that the shareholders would value. Now, the, the prevailing, uh, the, the, the contrasting theory is stewardship theory. Now, what stewardship theory says is that, look, you don't make it to be an executive at an organization, a high power position without actually having some form of character, without caring about that organization, without having some form of identification with that organization. So as an organization does better, you believe you've done better because you identify with the organization. Part of your uh, value, you know, your self-value, your self-esteem, your confidence, and what you are and what you do is wrapped up into your career. And your career is tied implicitly to this organization. So the better the organization does, the better you do and help the organization do better, the more satisfied you are. You're going to be a good steward of the organization. And compensation isn't your primary motive. Of course, everyone wants to be compensated, but your compensation really comes from this internal sense of satisfaction that your actions directly contributed to the success of the organization. And in this, using this particular theory, you're less likely to uh, reward or punish the CEO based on you know, the stock performance or other activities that the shareholders may find valuable. Instead, we believe that the CEO and top management team will intrinsically do what's best for the organization because they want to. That wraps it up for this lecture, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you've learned something from this. And don't forget, study hard. We'll see you later.